Hi, good evening. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Parish Art Museum and this lovely theater. If this is your first, uh, first time to a Friday night program and to a Pecha Kucha event specifically, you're in for a real treat tonight, so I want to welcome you here. My name is Cherie Calderoni. I'm the Membership and Visitor Experience Director. I'm always happy to see our members taking advantage of the benefits of their membership at the parish by attending our public programs, so shout out to all of you members. Um, membership benefits include uh, pub free or uh, lower cost public programs, classes, and invitations to member exclusive events such as our opening receptions throughout the year and we're about to start a brand new season of exhibitions. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the tremendous work that goes on to put, uh, to put on a Pecha Kucha program. So uh, acknowledgments to my colleagues, Olivia Mangini, Victor Miranda, and Eric Casey for their effort. And to my colleagues in the education department who bring us the student exhibition each year. And tonight in the audience, we have our education director, Kara Conklin Wingfield. So it's very nice to have the student exhibition happening when this is happening. Um, Friday night programming wouldn't be possible without our presenting sponsor, Bank of America, and additional support provided by the Corcoran Group and Sandy and Stephen Pearlbinder. And in April, we will welcome a new sponsor, Wheel Cornell Medicine in Southampton. Next week, for pro upcoming programs, next week we present Jazz with Bill O'Connell Quartet featuring Craig Handy. That's going to be Friday uh, night, April 1st at 6 p.m. And then the following week, Friday, April 8th, we have a film and talk, The 100 Years Show, starring Cameron uh, Herrera. If you have any questions about an upcoming program, please contact Olivia or email us at the museum. One last item, tomorrow we have a wonderful program and opportunity to meet and dialogue with 10 artist members of the parish. The artists will present recent works, some still in progress, and describe how they engage in their art. This runs from 11 to 1 and is a drop-in program, arrive at any time. It's really an interesting program. Now for our MC of the evening, it is my pleasure to introduce another member of the education team, Maria Elizabeth, Education Fellow. There you go. Thank you, Sheree. Um, I would also like to extend our thanks to all of the educators, staff, and students who contributed to the 2022 student exhibition. It looks amazing. If you haven't seen it, please take a look after um, this event. It's my pleasure to be the master of ceremonies this evening. Um, Pecha Kucha is a simplified presentation style originating from Astrid Klein and Mark Ditham. Each speaker shares 20 images for 20 seconds to show about how they live creatively. We are excited to be a part of this unique global event and are pleased to join cities in Spain, Japan, and Indonesia where Pecha Kucha nights are also taking place. Um, starting off this evening is Catherine Brigham, who teaches art at Shelter Island School. She teaches 15 grade levels, ranging from students ages 3 to 19 years old. Catherine graduated from Pratt Institute with an undergraduate degree in art and design and education, and earned a master's in teaching students with disabilities from Long Island University. She lives on Shelter Island full time. Catherine. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to start things off. Hit the button. Rarely is the beginning the good part. There are too many unknowns, too much explaining yet to happen. We don't know the characters and we don't know why we should care. And because we are overloaded with content every minute of every day, we are often unsure if we should care at all. In our brain, creativity comes in the editing. I showed up on the first day as the Shelter Island art teacher and thought, I'm just going to do my best. I know how to do this. I have been preparing my whole life for this. Everything has brought me here. For as long as I can remember, when people asked why I did anything, I said, it's just the best I can do. It isn't good, it isn't great, and really, how could that ever be enough? It was a revelation when someone pointed that you don't need just in front of your best. If it's your best, it's enough. I am an unapologetic tryhard. 
I think we should all be trying hard. <laughs> Show up, don't complain, push 2% harder at the end of the day. The next time you're feeling overly confident, I encourage you to stand in front of 15 freshmen and tell them what you know for sure. It was 2019 and grinning like a beautiful moron, I explained what their year in art was going to look like. We were going to work hard, learn, and grow together. It was gonna be magical. No, thank you, we're not going to do that. You are not the boss of me and your face looks old, older than your mom's. She was a better teacher than you. Teenagers have a way of pinpointing your insecurities with laser focus. My students were there to let me know that I was a fraud. It is easy to do things we are good at. It is harder to keep doing something we haven't been praised for. Young students have confidence that they are artists. They have not been told otherwise by themselves or anyone around them. I encourage you to stop telling kids they are talented. I don't believe in talent. You get talent from showing up. I draw, paint, sculpt, print, bead, sew, cook, garden, write, read, repair, design, edit, frame, embroider, organize, cut, share, travel, learn. I teach. I am the president of a board, a class advisor, and the only person in my visual arts department. I am a problem solver above all else. This is all to quantify that I live a creative life. I am a creative professional. Some of these I learned to do just by showing up. I can still do all these things because I continue to show up. Are you creative if you don't show art in a gallery or a museum? Are you creative if you make art but don't sell it? What if your hands don't make it? Is it still creative if it's engineering an experience or solving a problem? What about designing a series of questions to draw your audience to a conclusion? I was always hesitant to claim I am an artist. I thought being part I thought part of being a teacher is you put yourself in the background while you focus on what you are teaching. But teaching is better with honesty. This year I started explaining to my students I am diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It makes it difficult for me to focus on one thing at a time. I told my students I cannot hear them if someone else is talking in the room because my brain is trying to be all the places at once. Teaching well requires empathy. It asks us to look into our own lives and remember a time when we were unsure of ourselves. The first time you tried walking, you were unsuccessful, but you tried again. You persisted, and now you can likely walk and do other things at the same time. Imagine the first time you took those stumbly steps, you decided you weren't good at it, and stopped. I remember a spring in my early 20s when my sister said the most ludicrous thing I have ever heard in my life. I was in the studio looking for copper wire, which my sister had managed to misplace. When I asked her why she had the wire, my sister casually said, mom said I can have everything. <laughs> my response was quick and organic. Mom said you can have anything, not everything. I think about this a lot. What would it look like if we could have everything, not just anything? How can we use that idea to set students up for success? Every day I tell my students three things. I care about you. I'm glad you are here. I trust you to do the right thing. Above all else, I want my students to know that the art studio is a safe place. We all come here as students. We are insecure, distracted, and feel like a fraud. Try hard. Show up. Don't complain. Push 2% harder at the end of the day. I care about you. I'm glad you are here. I trust you to do the right thing. We continue to show up and practice, and every day we get a little closer to having everything. Creativity comes in the editing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.
Wow, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for talking about caring and not using the word just. Um, thank you for sharing that you have insecurities, as we all do, but we don't voice. I appreciate it. Um, your perseverance in your work is amazing and wonderful. It's an honor to have you here. All right. Um, I would like to introduce Margaret Schultes, uh, who is a student at Shelter Island School. Margaret is 17 years old and in the 11th grade. She's currently participating in drama club and art club. Her future plans include tattooing and illustration. Thank you all for having me. Sorry if I'm a little nervous. <laughs> I spend a lot of my time thinking about living creatively. How can I live creatively without losing or repeating ideas? Sometimes I try and make new designs, but my head isn't in the right place. Often when I think way, way too hard, I tend to focus on what other people will think of my artwork. I'm inspired by my surroundings, emotions, and want to experiment with different media. In my artwork, there are a lot of eyes. Eyes are so unique to me. They're the first thing that always grabs my attention when I'm talking to someone, and I love drawing and painting them. Art is important in my life because it's a way I can express my emotions and moods. I've always gone towards art when I feel like crap. It's like an escape to me. I wish I could draw all day long without worrying. One of my influences growing up was my dad's friend. He was like an uncle to me. When I was eight, he taught me never to be ashamed of what I was creating. He died a year later of a drug overdose, but I continued to create artwork because of him. He also told me I could create whatever I wanted to on a piece of paper. There are no rights or wrongs. When I'm making art, I feel calm and relaxed. No one can bother me while I'm drawing. I'm in my own bubbles. bubble. Often I feel productive if I'm drawing something more detailed. When I hear people say, I put my heart and soul into this painting, it makes me wonder if it was just a really good idea they had. I'd rather say, I put my energy and idea to what I create. It's one of the reasons I love putting colors in majority of my pieces. Color gives a piece of artwork life. My favorite colors are purple and green. These colors describe my emotions and are often used in my paintings. Purple is mostly used to either balance out one of my pieces or to calm down the viewer's mind. Purple is one of those colors that calm all my chakras. Green is a color I see as happy, calming, and positive all in one. Creativity is letting your mind flow freely and being surprised what you have made. Wouldn't it be boring if you had to stay in a line or your imagination couldn't let loose? That's not living creatively to me. Art to me is the literal definition of letting your mind flow freely and having fun while doing it. The best piece of advice I've ever been given has to be from my art teacher, Mrs. Brickham. One day I came into her room, just done with everything. I'm really bad at hiding my tears. So when I asked her if I could draw in her room, she said, yes, but are you okay? I said, yeah, but really went, nope, not at all. It was a stressful week, and I was worried about schoolwork. When I went to sit, I decided to draw one of my still life goals, and she came to me and said, we could talk now or make a plan later to talk. She offered to help me make a schedule to stay organized. I was snuffling all over the place, and I told her, I'm sorry I'm crying. She told me, instead of saying sorry, say thank you. You shouldn't apologize for your feelings or something you can't control. You can say thank you for listening. Don't apologize. That's one of the best pieces of advice I've ever been given, hands down. I use it a lot. When it comes to my artwork, trying to be unique is hard nowadays because it seems like everything has been done. It doesn't stop me from striving to be unique in my creative endeavors. When people see my artwork, I want them to know if they see an eyeball painting or something semi-colorful, that painting or drawing is made by me. The hardest thing for me when it comes to my work is still being motivated, interested after a long period of time. Sometimes drawing eyes or even colorful paintings get boring. In that scenario, I try to step out of my comfort zone. I'll draw a still life or try to recreate an exact photo of something or someone. Oftentimes when I'm discouraged, it feels like I just can't create anything anymore. I'm out of ideas or I tell myself I'm not good at what I do and should have chosen a different talent. But when that happens, I just let myself calm down, go outside for a walk, and even on those walks, I start getting my ideas back again. 
I'll jot them down in my brain and add them to my sketchbook so I don't forget. If I can become any piece of my artwork, I think I'd become the fairy sitting on a mushroom and looking at the moon. I would love to become a pretty fairy that doesn't have to worry about anything and can stare into the moon with a face for hours. But nothing compares to drawing or painting on a rainy day. The best advice I can give to an even younger artist would be don't stop practicing your artwork. Even if you feel like your creations aren't good or someone could do better than you, don't feel discouraged. It takes time and a lot of practice. For me, it took over 10 years to actually create art I thought was somewhat good and be confident in what I'm doing. I'm still not a professional artist yet. With that, I would say, don't be scared or embarrassed to show what you create. I feel pretty embarrassed for a couple of my pieces, but at the end of the day, I'm proud of what I make. It's all progress and everything takes time, especially art. It's difficult to follow my own advice. It's hard not to doubt yourself, but I trust I will conquer those feelings over time. If I could have given my younger self advice, I would say, listen to your art teacher. They know what they are talking about. Don't be shy or afraid to show your artwork, even if it's some cringy anime drawing or a really poorly drawn animal. If you dedicate yourself every day and take your time in learning and listen to your art teacher, so much will come your way with creativity and even being able to draw whatever you want, no rights, no wrongs. Thank you. <laughs> so good. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you so much for your energy. Um, I admire your confidence and your pride, and I wish so much for you. I'm so excited for what you'll create in your future. Our next presenter is Robin Gannis. She's originally from Cambridge, Massachusetts and found her way to the East End after graduating from Sarah Lawrence College. She spent her 20s managing the specialty food store Barefoot Contessa and in her 30s began her career teaching art. Robin teaches grades K to 12 at Bridgehampton School and has also served on the Parish Art Museum Education Committee. She is a ceramic artist and is also um, going to be featured at the event Encounters with artists, insights into the artistic practice, um, sorry, um, insights into the artistic process at the parish, um, which takes place tomorrow, uh, March 26th. Robin. Thank you very much. This is about, this is about teaching art. The first day I taught art, the first day of work, I was idealistic, inexperienced, ready to embark on the world of teaching art. Collected ideas had been fixed in my head, hopeful, optimistic, not feelings of dread. I never expected, by no means at all, that not each of my students would love art or call it their favorite subject over grammar or math. Some of them, quite a number, they sought other paths. I found those who approached it with skepticism and fear, trepidation, anxiety, or lopsided sneers. I began to hear grumblings under their breath. They weren't entirely comfortable in my classroom at best. The older they found me, the more it appeared. The feelings they held to constrained and interfered. Not every child thought that art would be fun or engaging and calming or easily done. Their expressions told me clearly art was not for everyone. I started to notice and then came to see some of them only seemed to like a sport that began with a B. <laughs> Killer B's basketball was all of the rage. So we did all kinds of things, drew their numbers on the page. 
And somehow I managed to get them to see they could start with that something and make it to be a good work of art and accomplishment they could see. Craftsmanship, details, it was time consuming work. Create a spark, look at art, make your mark and believe. How did I develop my insight to teach? Art to elementary, middle school and also teens by making and doing and doing it some more, understanding the way they saw it and challenging them to explore. I changed my way of thinking, and then I changed some more. I often got assistance, didn't do it all alone. Our community has resources and programs. The Parish Museum was important to me. I can tell you the reasons, but it's easy to see. This has been my journey, discovering the new concepts and teaching and learning to brew a hodgepodge infusion of whatever it took to see art and art making as important work. Art is more than one thing, drawing something you see to look exactly like it. That was not the only way art could be. There was so much more to it I could never have foreseen. Many methods to creating, so many ways things could be. When my students won't keep quiet, I read to them out loud. When they are too quiet, I implore them to assert themselves, speak proud. Such is the delicate back and forth persuasion, the wrangling and tangling in a day's work can be embrangling. Start in high school as a good artist, innovate and master. Make mistakes now and hereafter. Cubism, expressionism, pop art, op art, Dada and suprematism, outsider art. It's pure artistic feeling, good and bad, illustrated in forms, color, lines, shapes, texture, and contrast. Of course, you all know that hard work will pay off. So work harder, be creative, pioneer. And then you will see. A few years later, you might conquer the world of Instagram or land on a cover of a national magazine. Find a place, make connections to inhabit the world. Art is a problem solving process, both a verb and a noun. When it is well crafted, it will surely astound. Art is action and art is act. From the history of everything that has ever happened before, everything is possible and even something more. Art lives in us, art is being alive. Explore more, look closer, and learn more, you'll see. What it might feel like to do like what I do when I teach. Create art and make messes, follow the shapes, be versatile and improvise with texture and emphasis. This is what it feels like to do what I do, to color in between the lines and outside the lines too. My job is to help students broaden their reach, discover identity, lengthen the leash. Teaching is an art form to those like me. Art is my subject, my passion, my toil. I make art, I teach it, this gives meaning to me. But not just to my life, to those who I teach and teach with and live with and those out of reach. Art improves us, gives, us, gives our lives deeper meaning and feeds our souls. It makes us create from raw stuff, it helps us to become whole. So I suggest you speak up, be bolder, express yourself in new ways, or stick with the old ones, depending on the day. Art's not just one thing, it's more than you're told. It's neat and it's tidy, messy and fresh. It's gradual, elemental, brazen and finesse. Art is astronomical when art is at its best. It's funky and funny and filled with good cheer. It's color as emotion and lines that disappear. Art is discovery, discovery and flair. It is shapes that fit together. It's hard to end this there. You might think me crazy for rhyming all this or just kind of rhyming, whatever it is. But um, a teacher, even a teacher, might try something new to push themselves further and say something true. 
Art is what you see and also what you don't. Draw air, get outside yourself, put rhythm in your art. And did I mention one big thing you might not have known, how all my students have continued to continually keep teaching me. Art is hope. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Robin. Uh, thank you for trying something new, for exploring uh, this like, lyrical way that you spoke today. It was very beautiful. Um, I would now like to introduce Luna Paukar, who is a junior at Bridgehampton High School, whose interests include design and ceramics. This year, Luna contributed to the design portions of Student Council, National Honor Society, Culture Club, and the robotics team. Luna's favorite subjects are marimba and art. She shares these talents with friends and family from Honduras and Ecuador. By combining her culture, marimba, and art, one of Luna's goals for the future is attending Rhode Island School of Design. Luna. Traffic lights and people. I like and dislike them both. You might describe people's feelings as a color, like red or green. Whether you go or stop in a vehicle, it's decided by a red or green light. With people, you usually spend most of your time with them while they're in their green mood. With a traffic light, you spend most of your time with it when it's in a red mood. In winter, you do everything you can to be in a red temperature, since red is described as a warm color. But green isn't used to describe cold. It's either red or blue, or red and green. In this world, concepts are constantly changing, making things complicated for no absolute reason. Humans are mechanical people, aren't they? Roads, they take you everywhere, most literally and not. This road right here could have been the final path to a life, or it could have been the start. The road you all took today led you to here. There's always some sort of destination, whether you realize it or not, but it isn't always easy to find that road, to find what you need to get to where you want to be. Roads are just another version of a path, and a path can be anything. A path of life, a path of death, a path of joy, a path of sadness. It could be any length, any size, at any time of your life. Could it go from as big as the path from birth to death, or a strand of hair that uses as a path for lice? But just because the path isn't for you doesn't mean it isn't for others. Photography. Some of you might be like, now what is that? Well, it's a cactus. Photographers give most but the least context and can provide very heavy evidence but no context. It's like the way we all judge each other by how someone is represented. Here in an angle you see me. Certain angles can make a completely different view with a completely different context. That's the power of photography. You are in control of what others see and can't see. This right here is a whole wall, not a simple piece, but a whole alley. No one would have known that. A road again, but here the road is useless. Dogs, well animals in general have power to emotionally communicate with you. And it's beyond my comprehension. It's dangerous if you think about it. So many people feel such sympathy for animals that it really can go the wrong way. Well, for me, animals are my safe space. And it is of utmost importance that everybody has a safe space, no matter who you are. If not, find one, because the smallest moment of being in that space regenerates you to a point you won't even consider. And it doesn't have to be a person, a living thing. Then there's my abuela, my grandma. Family is the biggest concept of my life, my biggest purpose. Right here is the head of our family. She's the sun over the little planets. It only feels complete when she's right there. Our family is so large, but together we are one. So many personalities, hobbies, and dislikes, but together we are one. One thing my grandma does is cook the best food. She's from El Salvador, so food, music, and clothes are what separates the cultures in Latin America, and tamales are her specialty. Every time my lips touch the first bite, a surge of memories come. They overflow with scenes, remembering how I was raised, the things I did, and the places I went. Ecuador. 
I remember roaming down the streets of Cuenca for the first time, seeing so many colors, so many toys, so many clothes, everything little Luna dreamed of all at once. Now, I don't know this lady, but it brings up a core memory. It was my realization that I have a culture, that I come from immigrant parents who have amazing backgrounds, amazing countries. This is the Devil's Cauldron in Ecuador. This was the most breathtaking experience, though the name makes it seem otherwise. It was wonderful going somewhere and not seeing a McDonald's at every corner you turn. It's wonderful breathing such fresh air. Now, I did not go across that bridge, <laughs> but the journey there was amazing. Music, whether it's merengue, bachata, salsa, cumbia, I listened to it. But physically playing the music someone else would listen to feels so much better than putting my AirPods in and listening to the new Nicki Minaj album. I get excited hitting the marimba bars, listening to every note matched with other instruments. This is a piece that represents society's views on immigrants. I come from immigrants, my friends are come from immigrants. A lot of people walk past by our immigrants. A concept, an issue, a situation ignored by many. People are crossing the border, not my problem. People are being discriminated against, not my problem, but it is. Street art. Personally, the most magnificent way to address issues because all types of people drive, walk, and bike. This mural is called Akiyeya, here and there. It was a way to provide awareness of the social conditions that exist due to the racial intolerance. Michelle Ortiz made this to bring and empower the youth. She artists shows a different form of one's voice. It's more likely for someone to go past the building than to enter it. It's more likely for someone to stop and look at a mural than to enter an art shop with pieces that consist of two pencil marks. In Philly, every mural I passed was by accident. It imprints on me more than that one art piece. There's a general version for street art. It's usually a form of expression from the artist to the world. Love, there's no true form, just what you perceive of it. Respect, something our society lacks. Truth, because rather than say it, we hide it. Peace, it will never happen. This biggest controversial and conflicting issues all expressed by this mural. This is the same alley as before, just different messages, different colors, but the same style. There's faces, words, and bright colors. The people here, they're not white, maybe ethnic. The gender isn't clear, but does it have to be? The expression isn't clear, but is it necessary? Pottery, ceramics, clay. You can more than to anything you imagine. If you want a butterfly, make one. If you want a teacup, make one. If you want a corsair, I see you eat a light capillac CPU rotating cooling fan, except without the cooling rotating, then go ahead. Ceramics play huge roles with who you are and where you come from. Every culture has their own form of it, their own usage and history. These right here are not some $5 million pieces. They're simple, but it feels warm. You can feel the motion in each item. They're not for show, but for usage. They're not to brag about having, but to brag about what you have on them. It's not for my benefit, but for yours. Luna, thank you so much. I took a lot of notes during your, uh, during your Pecha Kucha. Thank you for sharing your experience um, and how you embrace so many different forms of art, not just visual, um, culinary, and music. Um, what really uh, struck me is the, this last piece about the unity um, across cultures with ceramics, it's so true. Um, I'm also curious about those first couple images, if they have titles, I wanna know. <laughs> um, I am now pleased to introduce Pearl Cherry Brown, who is also a student at Bridgehampton School. She explores creativity and loves to make props out of cardboard. One of her favorite classes is studio art. Her hobbies include drawing, crafting, and listening to music. Pearl. little, I wanted to become a doctor slash surgeon. I helped my grandma and mom with whatever they needed, so they called me their little nurse. 
I decided that I wanted to be a doctor because then I could help my mom, grandma, and maybe even everyone. From when I was in elementary all the way to now, I've been drawing and practicing. People are my favorite subject. Profiles, eyes, hands, mouths, etc. Um, so, uh, I drew this drawing in 2017, in late elementary to very, very early middle school. This drawing is a Queen of Hearts card. This was the first time that I can remember that I have made a drawing with a lot of detail as of shading and creativity. When I discovered that I didn't want to be a doctor or surgeon anymore, I was terrified to tell anyone, let alone my mom and grandma. Eventually, I told them what I really wanted to do was to be an artist. And when they saw my drawings, they encouraged me to keep drawing. This drawing, I was practicing my side profiles. And at the time they were drawn, I thought they looked pretty nice. I was proud of the shading and detail. Most of my drawings are monochromatic because for me, it's much easier to blend and shade with pencil than in color. And, and if I make a mistake, then I can erase it much easier than in color. Pencil is my favorite medium. The hardest thing for me to draw is our noses. So I usually draw in a more cartoony kind of style than a realistic style. The easiest thing for me to draw are eyes because I've practiced them so much over the years it just became second nature to me to draw an eye. I've drawn eyes so, so many times in my sketchbook my dad would call me the queen of eyes or something along those lines. <laughs> Any time I would show my mom or one of my drawings she would post it to Facebook and weeks later she would show me all the nice comments on my drawings. I spend a lot of time coloring this piece. This was all about blending and shading with color pencils. It's my favorite kaleidoscope design. My art teacher, Ms. Giannis, also told me that this drawing was in the museum. This project was about having value, texture, shape, line, form, color, space, and etc. For the coloring, I used a red and blue pen. It's mostly pen, but it's also pencil as well. This is a part of a Martha Luther King drawing project. I wanted to write a quote somewhere on it. So I thought it would be a good idea to make the reflection in the eye the famous I have a dream quote. I get my inspiration from my friends' amazing artwork, social media platforms, and sometimes even songs. This was from one of my favorite artists, Jack Starber's Micropop from the song Choice. When I draw eyes, I can make them as realistic looking or as cartoonish looking as I want. My favorite part of drawing is that there is no right or wrong way of doing it, unlike math. Drawing gives me freedom and peace of mind. Sometimes when I draw, I make people look much more powerful than they actually are. And this, I was drawing with both of my hands. By the way, I, draw, I write with my right hand. But the more I look at this drawing, I also see the meaning of how I felt that day. When I draw in color, I mainly, I mainly use color pencils and alcohol markers. The other mediums I use are pen, watercolor, alcohol, I mean, 
charcoal, and, um, and my iPad. Um, I also draw vent art. What vent art means to me is another fashion of communicating, but with vent art, I can make more accurate, accurately showing my emotions better than I ever could with words. Something else that is also very important to me is to find out who I am. Other, wait, oh. Something else that is also very important to me, other than art, is to find out who I am. I am a part of the LGBTQ plus community, and this drawing of mine is an example of how I feel most of the time. Okay. I'm, going to, I'm going to end with a poem. This is for English. My love for art. I love drawing day and night. If you try to make me stop, we'll have a fight. With art, I can use any tool. If you try to make me stop, you're as good as a fool. My love for drawing will never end. Hours on hours, even days I spend. Making drawings for my fam. I love to draw, that's just who I am. Thank you so much, Pearl. Um, it was really lovely to, um, to hear about how <laughs> your life path changed from being inspired to be a doctor and a surgeon um, to being an artist. And I love that you had a community on social media um, that shared lots of encouraging feedback. I love when that happens. Um, I also want to thank you for sharing your emotion and um, sharing how drawing um, creates a sort of peace of mind. Um, and this journey that you're, you're on with your uh, sexuality is awesome, wonderful. Thanks for sharing. Um, I'd also like to um, talk, um, introduce um, our next speaker today, uh, Margaret Zuberian, who teaches at East Hampton High School. Margaret graduated from Parsons in the New School of Design with a BFA in illustration. She worked as an intern prop builder for the Jim Henson Company, a set painter for Women's Expressive Theater in New York City, and has created murals in the Bronx, Manhattan, and most recently a large commission at Gurney's in Montauk. Um, Margaret is a mother of two and is in her sixth year teaching painting, drawing, and sculpture at East Hampton High School. Margaret. Hi, everyone. Okay. One more, One more time. Just kidding. Okay, so here I am on the left, age 10. My mom once told this little girl that if she did what she loved, she would never work a day in her life. So I went to Parsons and I studied illustration. I took any creative odd job I could find, always just trying to make it work as an artist in New York City and in the process building a really eclectic CV. So this series, my view of Manhattan, sold at a studio on the Upper West Side. That first big sale allowed me to pay my share of the rent that month, which absolutely blew my 22-year-old mind. I've since painted murals in the Bronx, on Long Island. I was a, a technician at a print shop. Like I said, intern prop builder at Jim Henson was a really cool job. Then in 2016, I left New York City to teach at East Hampton High School, where I'm currently amassing a following of teenage sculptors. So I'm trying to perfect, perfect the art of teaching artistic behaviors in a choice-based studio, which I believe our young artists really respond to. I find myself constantly asking, what do you want to do? And they answer. The best work is developed when it comes from a personal place, right? So when artists, it doesn't matter what the age, are given the space to showcase their narrative, the resulting work is always so strong. So here, a trio of slipcast owls, an artist celebrating her Mexican heritage, another in honor of her musician father. And then this happened, and it felt like all creative personal projects just stopped. So becoming a mother superseded all else. I became mommy first, then Ms. Z, then the artist was a little bit later. So let me tell you a story about the little bunny car on the right. I got it at a gift shop that was attached to a small ceramic studio just outside Cuyahoga National Park in Ohio. 
The woman behind the counter looked at my very obvious six month pregnant belly and asked how many months. She kind of looked like my mom, long natural gray hair and turquoise earrings and I tell her six. I tell her I'm a ceramics teacher, that I'm like her, an artist and illustrator. And she tells me that being an artist and becoming a mother will obviously change you. You will stop making art. So not something I want to hear. She wraps my rabbit car in blue tissue paper. I think it's too expensive. I think about the wheel popping off. But you're an artist, she says. And you will find time to make art again, and it will be even better for it. So I've always made a point to carry a sketchbook and use it as a visual journal, but now experiences are heavier. My little Cora was born a successful VBAC on Mother's Day at the onset of the pandemic. Only a week or so after New York City, excuse me, New York decided that it was okay for partners to be in the room with mothers, and I thankfully didn't have to give birth alone. So I use writing and drawing to work through difficult emotions. It slows me down. It allows for a space to work through everything and be reflective. I gather myself on the page when I feel like I've been spread way too thin. So here, a rainbow appeared the day my husband's Tia Maritza passed away. She had caught COVID in April. So keeping a sketchbook is therapeutic for me. I use drawing to strengthen my mental health, work through bouts of depression, illustrate my anxiety, uh, work through obsessive negative behaviors. Drawing is the way of putting all of that on pause. So an example on the right, an illustration. When pet birds are distressed or bored, they'll sometimes resort to picking out all their feathers as a coping mechanism, something that I can honestly relate to. So, a self-portrait um, as a mombi. Um, dropping that coffee mug was what just did it for me here. So all these layers, right? Mom, teacher, artist. The challenge now is how to maintain my innate artistic identity as a working mom. And the answer? keep painting. So when my son was 10 months old, I was commissioned by Gurneys and Montauk to create a massive piece that took six months to complete, having to limit work to only Saturdays. Um, so roughly 250 hours of work. Thank you, Johnny, my husband, for understanding that this, all of this, is something that I absolutely need to do. So hidden behind a fake china cabinet door, the piece stretches down two narrow hallways that secretly connect Tilly's to the Regent Cocktail Club. It was inspired by actual postcards that were written by visitors at the beginning of the 1900s, and I went for this speakeasy Art Deco aesthetic. Um, I'm extremely proud of this piece. Thank you, Mary Fallon and Amanda Capabianca for making it possible. So inspired, I developed Lehigh Mural with my sister uh, to keep working and honestly just have an excuse to hang out with her. Um, last summer, we won first place out of 26 artists at the first annual mural contest at the clubhouse in East Hampton, um, and these pages were pulled directly from my um, art journals. So a punk band, a podcast. I've realized that I'm not alone in feeling a constant need to keep making, to keep being creative while balancing full-time work, parenting, and whatever else we all have on our plates constantly. Um, I use art to maintain a relationship with the creative community, to keep myself busy, to keep collaborating um, more. So now here I am as the student. Last summer, I started taking online art classes to better my understanding of different materials, more advanced methods, and along with new skills, I regained a student's perspective and found another way to inspire young artists to be lifelong learners. So biggest takeaway, watercolor takes a lot of patience or just buy yourself a blow dryer. <laughs> when the pandemic initially hit and we were all home, the art supplies came out every day and I started collaborating with my then two-year-old son. So the piece on the left probably entertained him for what, like five minutes? Um, he won't remember how exhausted I was, hopefully, but only that we were making art together every day. Um, then Cade and I made postcards for the 21 artists whose senior year was interrupted in such an unprecedented way in 2020. I wrote each of them personal messages uh, to congratulate them on all their efforts and send them love from my living room um, as they moved on from East Hampton High School. And as quarantine rolled on, we started making postcards to keep in touch with everyone. So everyone got one. Some sent me stamps to fund the project. Um, friends, family, we made thank you cards, started pen pal exchanges with old coworkers and artist friends. I took pages from my art journals and I layered them on top of my uh, little exploratory paintings. So to close, it's so important to find your way to be creative and please make time for it, whatever the medium. So dance in the kitchen, sing in your car, start carrying a sketchbook, um, make art, whatever the form. Uh, to see more of my work, you can follow me here, uh, Lehigh Mural or at Fallon Art on Instagram. Um, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>
Margaret, thank you. Thank you for sharing your methods of creating your story of motherhood. Um, it's ongoing story, I'm sure. Excited to hear more um, as time goes along. Um, thank you for sharing um, how illustration and drawing is a coping method for you. Also, I really identify with breaking a mug at the beginning of the pandemic. It was my breakdown moment as well. Yeah. Um, I would now like to introduce um, Kim Bermeo, who's a Latinx artist from East Hampton. Uh, is currently a, a senior at East Hampton High School. Kim's work consists of portraiture, but their style of art is ever evolving. Kim's work is influenced by their Ecuadorian heritage and focuses on their identity as an Ecuadorian American while continuing to address assimilation through their story and artwork. Kim has been a part of the art community for several years and is involved in both the Golden Eagle and the Guild Hall Teen Art Council, which has helped fuel their artistic development. Kim. First off, I want to say thank you and good evening. My name is Kimber Mayo. Now, a little fact, a few months I turned eight, uh, ago, I turned 18. In the 18 years I've been on this earth, I've always considered myself an artist. However, just like myself and my identity, my artwork has always been changing, ever evolving. Early in high school, I started drawing portraits and figure drawings. I was in love with the realism and how closely I could get a piece of my work to look so very lifelike. I would honestly consider myself a perfectionist because of this. For a long time, that was all my work consisted of. My goal was perfection, but at the time, my idea of perfection was to create a replica of the source. Create an image so perfect in which the viewer would confuse my work for a photograph. This era of my artwork you see now is around when I was in early high school, freshman, sophomore. The time I was still figuring out who I was, not only as an artist, but as a person. The time I was learning about the quadratic formula and chemistry and eventually stuck at home due to the pandemic. My work during this time consisted of life drawings, bodies, portraits, and eventually landscapes. However, all my work had no fuel of passion. My pieces had the intended purpose into being perfect, which I thought was ideal and not necessarily a bad thing, but I slowly came to realize that it was just not me. My initial work is made of charcoal and graphite. I concentrated on graphite and colored pencil portraits until around my sophomore year of high school, where I, be I began to explore using paint. I never specifically used acrylic, oil, or even watercolor to create any of my pieces before this time, due to the fear that my inexperience with those mediums wouldn't allow me to create a piece that I was proud of. Thankfully, I got over that fear and began to explore using different types of mediums for my work. I used colors my past self would never dare to touch to make portraits and other paintings. I began to grow as an artist and pushed myself out of the confined box of perfection I had placed myself in. Now this painting and the last marks the beginning of coming into my identity. During this time, I had to begin exploring who I was, not as a person, as an artist, as a human being. My boat piece is titled A Dark Night of Freedom. It was a step into exploring other subjects other than people, which was huge for me. This piece reminds me of one of my favorites as it holds significant shift in me as an artist, a shift that completely changed my work. I had always feared I would never find a style or my style, that I would remain only creating works that had no specific meaning to me. That was until this year where I finally began to stand strong in my identity and allowed to explore art that was imperfect in my mind. I did this through a method my teacher, Miss Evans, called stream of consciousness writing. Initially, I would write in straight lines left to right across the page. However, as I became more comfortable and let my emotions guide me, my writing shifted. Whenever I was full of emotions or just couldn't put my words uh, or feelings into something concrete, I engaged in stream of consciousness. 
I know some of you may relate that sometimes when you think of something, you just see an image pop into your head. That happens to me. After writing, or during my writing process, I would begin to incorporate these images into my stream of consciousness, layering them among my thoughts and feelings. The people experienced things and moments I thought of when writing were laid on that page. I was blown away by this instance, because to me, it meant I finally had pieces of work that had meaning to it. I finally had a passion. Whether people knew it or not, I was telling a story about myself and my experiences in my work. I began to explore this even further by exploring the idea of layering items, images, words onto each other, began to explore the idea of pattern and color that in early stages of, of my journey as an artist, I never thought of doing. Each of my pieces began to have a touch of me in it. My stories and my identity were all in those pieces. This idea of layering I explored in 3D sculptures, portraits, observation drawings, and began creating my style. Some of the image you'll see here now are made during this stretch of time in where I was experimenting, which lasted a few months, <laughs> but still continues to this day. I had finally made a point in my identity as an artist in which I didn't let myself be guided or swayed by what I thought people wanted to see in my work. Instead, I began to create what I wanted. This period of time is a wild one as I experimented with just about anything. My art began to grow with me as I began to tell the story of my identity. During this time, I finally started coming into the identity as I entered my junior and senior year, something concrete, something that was me. Through my work, I expressed my struggles with my identity as a queer non-binary person, as well as my struggles with being accepted and accepting my Ecuadorian heritage, which is what you will see in a little bit. To give a little bit of context to the next piece about my heritage, I'm a first-generation Ecuadorian American. As a first-gen, I felt that I never really fit into a box. I was too Latina for non-Latinx friends and was too gringa for the Latinx community. I noticed that assimilation had taken a toll on my identity, which is what this work speaks about, though unfinished. This was the first instance in which I fully engaged a story into my piece and where I placed my worries about my identity into. I created these last few pieces this year and I'm so happy with all of them. Ah, one second. They hold a special place in my heart and I can feel that my identity is held within them, which is my new goal as an artist. I strive for perfection, but that definition has now changed like I have. When, whether that is taking, talking about my struggles with assimilation, the love I have for my friends, or the acceptance of my queer identity, I know I will never run out of stories to tell through my work because that I am forever changing. And although I feel confident in the person I am today, I know I will only continue to grow just as my artwork has. I hope you will all continue watching my journey as a person through my art and will relate to the stories I will share in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you so much for sharing your transformation from photorealism and perfection um, to discovering what your style is. Um, and, um, oh, I don't even, can't read that, sorry, <laughs> my notes. Um, but I hope that you continue to experiment um, and listen to yourself. Um, and I hope that you continue to not fit inside of a box. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Pamela Collins, who teaches at art at Southampton High School. She has an MFA in painting and drawing from Brooklyn College and both a BFA in painting and drawing and a BS in art education from SUNY New Paltz. She teaches a range of classes, including studio and art, mural painting and set design, college level drawing, advanced painting, and portfolio development. Pamela. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. Um, this body of work is influenced by my philosophies as an art teacher. This piece encapsulates everything about a beginning, like the Big Bang, with cosmic materials expanding outwards while time pushes onwards. In the middle of it all is a figure.
This profile became a representation of me. I moved collage materials around until they gradually got absorbed into works of art. Even failed artwork was reborn like this piece titled Five Cents. At this time, I made art out of anything, even the thoughts of my own mind. Others arrived in the pictures too. It wasn't only about me anymore. I started to incorporate symbols. Wings became a symbol of freedom and or implied freedom. Their delicacy is present in all of us. Some use it, some do not, and some cannot. Handmade books became my canvases. Their turning pages helped me create multiple meanings. I use this motion as a compositional element and an entry point into paper mechanics. And slowly, words and found poetry started to emerge. Every collage became a chance to incorporate cryptic phrases as another layer of meaning. And the stars aligned, directing my thoughts into a new gravitational pull. There were so many new things to see and do, but were they really new? I was reconnecting with someone I've known before, me, in places I've been before with the chance to express what I wouldn't normally feel comfortable to express. This is the first page of a two-page spread. It reads, we become a collaged architecture. And the adjoining page reads, of secrets in spirit worlds. In this new realm, I questioned, could there really have been another force controlling my thoughts and feelings? Was my only option to go through life as an automaton? Can't I be me? This is another two-page spread. It reads, it's so easy to change the moon when you want the and the adjoining page reads, universe, with Y-O above the U in universe. When we emphasize the us, we can truly be who we are here in the most stunning way, surrounded by supernatural flowers, plants, and friendly insects, we can thrive. We can also find our true self in the face of reality. This piece reads, promise kindness from the truth, okay? Like love radiating out from within, one kind word can change the world. Here is the glow of self-actualization as a mind expands with rays of light, stars, and cosmic static. It reads, see yourself illuminating the background of time. This piece reads, follow your heart. And when the string is pulled, the word everywhere is revealed. If we approach life with a good heart, it will direct us in a positive direction, the direction of us. Living with a good heart and being joyful and experiencing wonderment is a choice that has a profound impact on our existence. It is the beauty of being alive. It is the embodiment of hope. Because of this, the feelings of always going forward in a positive way is omnipresent while I'm creating. It is the reason the butterfly emerges from its cocoon. 
This change is empowering and accompanied by the hum of fluttering wings and illuminated by rays of light. This is an in-progress picture of a mechanical creature. Its heart expresses primal feelings in rhythmic beats. When you pull the strings, the chamber of the heart opens to reveal the phrase, love this heart. There is no better time than now to express love, love of life, love of others, and love for yourself. Start your artistic journey or continue your adventure of self-discovery now. Rise above anything that traps you. As you travel, deliver this message to others. Help others actualize their true destiny. Support others to express their feelings without judgment. Together, we can change the universe. This is one of my latest creations. It is a profile with a spectacular masquerade mask presenting an automatic playing card shuffler. <laughs> Please see my Instagram account at PamCollins17 if you would like to see more and follow my artistic journey. Again, that's Pam Collins 17. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. It has been a pleasure to work with you as part of the Parish Collaborative Club at Southampton High School. Um, and it's been a pleasure to learn um, about your work here, um, the ethereal and the supernatural is really triggering and I'm sure a lot of um, you can under, uh, also identify um, with these questions of um, the universe and existence um, and humanity um, that Pam brought up. Uh, wrapping up this evening is Talis Pinto, a senior at Southampton High School. He's an artist and photographer inspired by his taste in music and the beautiful nature around him. He creates graphic art using his photography, blended with the vision he wants to share with the world. Beginning in 2018, Talis conducts photo shoots of his peers and photography of Brazilian monuments, an homage to his family's heritage. Theo Pinto and Hamilton Aguiar are two artists that have inspired Talis and dedicated their time to help him create his own artwork and discover more about his surroundings. He will share with you the journey of his true vision. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Christmas Day, 2018. I was sitting near the tree with my family, opening our presents and having a generally fun time. My, par my parents were laughing about last night's Christmas movie while my sister kept receiving socks. I was getting shirts, candles, and video games, typical teen presents for a teenager to cherish and use. My dad came up to me holding a big box with Christmas decorated wrapping over it. Open it, my dad said, excitedly waiting for my reaction. Eagerly, I tore the box open, revealing the bubble wrap inside. I grabbed the gift and held it out in front of my family. My parents applied happily as I pulled out a DCLR camera. I remember that day like yours yesterday. I loved examining the body, the lenses, everything about it was fascinating. I couldn't wait to try it out and explore more of where I live. A few days later, I went into town with my friends to try out my new camera. At the time, I didn't know what settings to put on, how to change the ISO, where to use flash at the right time, or how to keep the lenses clean. Because of this, the first photos that I took came out very blurry. I took around 150 photos and only around 20 were mostly clear. At first, I felt puzzled. Then I reminded myself that the photos weren't going to be picture perfect. It meant that I was going to remind, I was going to have to find the steps and the motivation to get better shots. That year was filled with multiple photo shoots with models, experimentation, exploring cool landmarks around my town, and educating myself more on digital cameras. 
Then in February, my cousin Theo asked me if I wanted to go to the city with him for the day and take pictures. I was very intrigued by his invitation and immediately texted him, yeah, in all caps. During that time, we were in his art studio testing out cameras that he had and learning about Photoshop and Lightroom. Theo had the idea to drive me around the city while I took pictures. Damn, I shot a boy and must have been exhausted that day. <laughs> while we were entering the Manhattan Bridge, I had a feeling that the golden hour from this view would be a fascinating shot. I looked into the viewfinder, pointed the camera at the top of the bridge, and clicked on the shutter button. It felt surreal to look at. The setting sun hitting the suspension bridge, the flock of birds flying through the bridge, and the pink sky's beauty in the background. It made me realize how fortunate I am, how majestic views like these are rare to catch. It made me think about what else I could capture. Next year, I started experimenting with more photo shoots, trying out the lighting, using black and white, and mixing up the shutter speed. A friend of mine, Derek, asked me if I could shoot photos of him during basketball practice, and I excitedly accepted. He was doing high layups and testing his skills while I was testing my own skills behind the camera. I made a split second decision that I thank God for, using high shutter speed. Every time he jumped in the air, I took a photo. An hour later, I looked over the images and was amazed. Almost all the photos looked like I stopped time itself, capturing the exact moment forever. While riding around Sunset Key in Florida during this winter break, a text message at the right moment helped me, inspire me to create Disappear. When my mom texted me to come watch the sunset with us, I rode my scooter to one of the corners of the island, opening the gate to meet my parents. While we looked towards the reddish-orange horizon, I was asked to snap a quick photo of my parents in the sky. I ended up creating something special to remember how I felt at that moment, apart from my typical vacation shot. Most of my art, oh, shit, this background. <laughs> um, most of my artwork comes from these random bursts of inspiration as I'm influenced by my present surroundings. For this image, I was inspired by my self-portrait in my portfolio because I wanted to use a similar process to create a layered effect. Their themes of a ritual distorted reality are inspired by playing a lot of video games and learning more about myself, specifically video game glitches. When I was a kid, I did not see the world through other people's eyes, but through a different perspective. I was always different as a child and was never labeled as normal, but seeing the world through these artistic lenses helped my process in art. Three days later at my uncle's apartment, I took out my laptop and imported the five photos into Photoshop. My first step was to layer the images and change their colors. After making some edits, I changed my mind and cropped them to only show a specific part of the entire photo, like the clouds. This collage effect made these elements stand out and help bring my vision to life. I focus on specific sections of the piece, such as duplicating the clouds and rocks and cropping the ocean to show movement. A setback was deciding whether putting less color would harm the sunset's light after all, this was the most vibrant sunset I have seen during my trip, and I didn't want to alter its effect. To fix this, I tried distorting the image and blended the clouds' hues to create a glitchy section. The more I changed the settings on my image, the closer the result matched my vision. After the piece was complete, I felt pride in adding it to my portfolio. During the, creation, during the piece's creation, I put my headphones in and turned on M-Tone by Deftones with its vivid vivid lyrics. The song reminded me of the exact moment of being on the island in the nostalgia of seeing such a beautiful moment. What I tried to capture my art is a dystopic alternate reality that serves as a lens to my inner vision. My camera reminded me to always value the beginnings. I started off with blurry pictures and very bright lighting but knew I wouldn't be a natural. I still have room for improvement on my artwork and hope to grow even more in color. Photography has taught me to look towards the future while appreciating the journey that started off with a click. Thank you. Wow, thank you 
so much, Talis. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with you as well um, as a part of Parish Collaborative. Um, thank you for explaining how you have explored photography and how that started for you. Um, uh, I also like how um, randomness inspires, um, inspires your photography, random events, love it. Um, can we please get a round of applause for all of the presenters today? You are all amazing, um, and it has been an honor to work with you um, and to introduce you today. Um, I hope that you will all stick around. Um, the museum is open until eight o'clock, and if you haven't yet seen the um, 2022 student exhibition, please do so. Have a great night.